It started with a call to 911. Okay, where did you see her last? Um, I saw her at like 12 o'clock last night. More than a decade later, an admission. What is your plea to count one involuntary manslaughter, a felony of the third degree? Guilty. A young woman disappears, later found dead. It could be a child. Investigations spanning two states. How did she die? What, what caused her death? And then where was she when she died? Her fiance turned suspect. They don't know me, and uh, I know me. I know that I would never hurt Caitlin ever in a million years. And her father's fight to find justice. This has been a long time coming, long time. This is WLWT Investigates, vanished at 21. Her death shrouded in mystery for more than a decade, and now tomorrow, the man who killed Caitlin Markham will learn his punishment. Thanks a lot for joining us. I'm Mike Dardis. And good evening to you. I'm Sheree Palello. Caitlin's fiance taking a plea deal for his role in the horrific crime. WLWT's investigative reporter Karen Johnson has been covering this case since day one. And tonight, Karen sharing Caitlin's story, taking us all the way back to the beginning in Fairfield in 2011. In the heart of Fairfield, Ohio, summer break was winding down. The clanking sounds of carnival rides at the Sacred Heart Festival echoed throughout the neighborhood. Yet half a mile away from the enticing aroma of corn dogs and cotton candy, a mystery was about to unfold. Hi, my name is John Carter. I am calling, um, I, I know that you're not supposed to report a, a missing person after before 24 hours. Um, but uh, my, my fiance is missing. I, I can't find her anywhere. Okay, where did you see her last? Um, I saw her at like 12 o'clock last night. She stays in a house by herself. Um, so she, I'm, just, I'm really nervous. Her car is still there. John Carter's fiance, Caitlin Markham, would never be seen again. Instead of celebrating Caitlin's 22nd birthday, friends and family ramped up search efforts, despite Fairfield police saying there was no indication of foul play. Caitlin is the love of my life. I've been with her for six years. We've been engaged for a year. Today would be exactly a year. Um, today's also her birthday. On the side As searchers divided into groups. Five more. And hit the streets by foot, car, and by ATV. Carter walked us through the last time he saw Caitlin, the night of August 13th. He said he left her townhouse around 11, 11.30 and received a text message from her about an hour later. Caitlin sent me a picture of her and that was the last message I got. When Caitlin failed to show up for her job at David's bridal the next morning, friends began to worry. I kept texting her, no response, no response. I call her, no response. I have nothing in mind. She would never just leave. She's too pragmatic. She would never just take off and go somewhere. I'm terrified. I'm absolutely terrified. I, I just want to find Caitlin and, and celebrate her birthday with her and go to Red Lobster like she was planning. That's all I want to do. In the days that followed, the community began to realize there was much more to Caitlin than just a face on a missing person poster. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. She was just so sweet and like so hyper and like fun to be around. A colorful and eccentric art student who helped others come out of their shell like a butterfly. She's like a light. She's one of these young ladies who has so much enthusiasm and uh, has dreams and hopes. Darkness now overshadowed the light Caitlin brought into this world. Some of us feel so helpless. Friends tried to make sense of her disappearance. Caitlin's father, Dave, unable to hold his head up during a vigil. While pictures of his daughter, set to song, played for her community as they prayed for her safe return. I'm so very proud to be her father. At the time, Dave Markham and John Carter appeared united in their grief. Please don't take my son. Shine away. News of Kaylin Markham's disappearance began to spread across state lines and into the home of Texas EquiSearch founder Tim Miller. Finding Kaylin, he said, would be a challenge. Many other cases we get, there might be some information on cell phone towers, there might be something on surveillance, there might be a, a witness that's seen him at a store. Kaylin's case is just, she has vanished. Again, police said there was no evidence of foul play. 
but there was also no indication Caitlin left on her own. 19 days into the search, Dave Markham found comfort in the amount of support he was getting from Texas EquiSearch, now leading the search in Ohio. You know, I don't know if I'd be able to, what I'd be doing without all this. Um, and to see everybody who doesn't know Caitlin and the community just showing up, it's very comforting. Volunteers tore their way through heavily wooded areas, scoured creeks and trekked along train tracks and abandoned buildings, looking for any clues that would lead Caitlin home. Hot summer days turned into chilly fall nights. Searches continued. It could be our child, and, and every time I see Dave Markham, I see his face, I think of my children, and he needs us out there. By the following year, the reward for information leading to an arrest and conviction in Caitlin's case rose to $50,000. In June of 2012, there was a lead. 26-year-old Gapreet Kang, who previously lived across the street from Caitlin, was accused of sexually assaulting a Miami University student. Fairfield police wanted to know more. Excuse me, Mr. Kang. Do you have any connection to the Caitlin Markham disappearance? No, no. Kang was eventually ruled out as a suspect in Caitlin's disappearance. Meanwhile, whispers around town suggesting Carter may be responsible grew louder. People are going to say what they're going to say. You can't stop them. He was the last one to see Caitlin, and he felt the finger pointing. They don't know me, and uh, I know me. I know that I would never hurt Caitlin ever in a million years. When approached while passing out flyers. I guess he didn't know who I was, and he was just like, I heard the boyfriend did it. And just, I was just like, I'm, I'm the boyfriend. I would never do anything to hurt her. A major development in one of the tri-state's most talked about missing persons cases. April 10th, 2013, a father's intuition, now a reality. I had a strong feeling. Indiana State Police confirmed skeletal remains found off Big Cedar Road in Cedar Grove a few days earlier belonged to Caitlin Markham. For Dave, the outcome had been a fear and an expectation. I'm glad I could finally put her to rest and, and move on to the next chapter and, and find answers and, and figure out what, what happened. Andy Hicks was out searching for scrap along this rural winding road when he stumbled upon human remains. We was just, you know, moving stuff around, looking through there, and then I turned around and I uh, seen the bone laying there and picked it up and I said, that ain't no animal, you know. I said, that's a uh, human jaw bone. Hicks said the bones did not appear to be buried, simply dumped with trash piled on top. As he looked further, an even more disturbing discovery. Top part of the skull was sticking out of a uh, like a Kroger's plastic grocery bag. With the investigation now crossing state lines, Indiana police took the lead. The two big questions here are: uh, first of all, how did she die? What what caused her death? And then where was she when she died? On the second anniversary of Caitlin's disappearance, the coroner ruled her death a homicide, cause undetermined. It was a tough day to be out in public, but Dave chose to share it with the community. Who has been by his side. Very sad day, um, day I've been looking forward to and a day I've been dreading. Carter's reaction sent to me in a text. I was only on the news before because I wanted to find Caitlin. Now that is done, I have no interest in putting myself on camera. I just want to mourn my loss and try to put my life back together. In the meantime, Dave's mission hadn't changed. Stop waiting. I mean, you know, it's, it's time. So. I think, I think somebody knows something and I'd like for them to step forward. More eyes became focused on Carter as Caitlin's remains were dumped along a familiar stretch of road. The most direct route from Carter's home in Fairfield to his father's Indiana farm on Kokomo Hill. A forensic anthropology report was made public years later. It noted injuries to Caitlin's left wrist, three or four sharp force wounds. The report also revealed Caitlin's skull was found inside a knotted plastic grocery bag. Since her head had not decomposed in the bag, the belief was her body was first hidden somewhere else and then moved to Big Cedar Grove. In our interview, it was the first one that he had ever uh, asked for an attorney. Still ahead, my exclusive interview with two key investigators who made it their mission to find justice for Caitlin. United through grief, 
Dave Markham found himself connecting with other murder victims' families. By 2014, Fairfield police had six unsolved homicides on their hands. It gets more frustrating because, you know, none of them get solved. Families of Chelsea Johnson, Lainey Gwinner, Joey Oakley, Damian Taylor, and Deasia Sims were all seeking justice. It doesn't seem like any, any cases get solved um, by investigation or by police. It's more of confessions. And it's very frustrating and it's kind of scary. The youngest of the six, 15-year-old Chelsea Johnson. Her body was found near a creek bed. She was stabbed to death. I would not wish this pain on my worst enemy. 19-year-old Joey Oakley was murdered four months after Chelsea was killed. He was found in the same creek bed, shot multiple times. He was 19, going to be 20, and he had such a long life to live. 29-year-old Damian Taylor killed in his apartment that same year. Weeks before Christmas, 20-year-old Deasia Sims' body was found near the waterworks plant. Lainey Gwinner's death dates back to 1997. She was last seen alive, leaving a Fairfield bowling alley. Her body discovered a month later in the Ohio River. As the holidays approached, all the families were reminded they'll be starting another new year with no answers. I get to relive it every four, you know, every year. This is the fourth year coming and it hurts. The start of 2015 began with a big boost in reward money. By now, Dave began demanding action. It is going nowhere now and it's time for a change. Time for new detectives to investigate, he said, and take a look at what a Florida-based private investigator uncovered. Jay Ryan Green told us he made his way into Caitlin and John's inner circle, interviewed more than a dozen people. Green narrowed his investigation down to two people who he believed knew what happened. Subject one took a polygraph and uh, failed the polygraph in epic proportion per the polygraph examiner examiner he handed his findings over to Fairfield police but says it went nowhere when there's results like this handed in, in your lap and, and nothing happens yeah it's it's frustrating and, and, it, and it makes me angry it makes me very angry as another year came to a close Dave called for not only new detectives but also a new agency to take over the case. I do not trust or believe that the direction of the Fairfield Police Department took from the very beginning and continues to cling to is going to solve Caitlin's murder. I'm pleading with Sheriff Jones as the chief law enforcement officer of this county to take over the case. The investigation now in the hands of the Butler County Sheriff's Office. After months of working the case, in 2016, detectives revealed they believe they know who killed Caitlin. We believe we have narrowed it down to uh, a strong person of interest. They would not name the person. The sheriff's office made it very clear they weren't going to tell me specifics. Sitting down with me last month, Detective Joe Nerlinger and Sergeant Rob Whitlock peeled back the curtain to their investigation. It started with John Carter's 911 call. She was at her house. She was going to bed. The 911 call stood out to us. So when we're looking at their timeline of things and we listen to this 911 call, I remember telling Joe, I'm like, this is, this is made up. This, this call, and you can hear it in his voice. It's, this is a lie. But with 20 other persons of interest and no smoking gun, they had a lot of work to do. So we went through and uh, meticulously alibied people out different ways until Carter was the last man standing. We brought up things um, evidentiary wise and I've never had a suspect point out to me that something is, uh, what did he say it was? Circumstantial. It's very rare for someone that we interview to use that word. In our interview, it was the first one that he had ever uh, asked for an attorney. At the very end, four months later, when we presented our letter to the admin of what we had done, our, the, the, the last line in it is, these investigators, in their opinion, believe that John Carter is responsible for the disappearance and death of Caitlin Markham. That's how confident we were. But with no direct evidence, investigators knew it would be a tough one to prosecute. 
Caitlin Markham's name slowly faded from headlines after the major development that brought Dave hope. A look from above shows you the field that has been taped off with crime scene tape. A body found today back near the tree line. Another young woman's body found in a Liberty Township field. 23-year-old Ellie Wyke lived one town away from Caitlin and had been reported missing. Ellie and Caitlin's appearances were strikingly alike. Westchester police quickly made an arrest in Ellie's murder. Michael Strauss, who had been stalking her in the weeks leading up to her death. Then this picture surfaced of Strauss in a group photo with John Carter at the Sacred Heart Festival. Carter confirmed to me the photo was taken after Caitlin's death, but it sparked new conversations about a possible link between the two homicides. But as time passed, it seemed social media was more interested in a connection than investigators. This has been a long time coming, a long time. After more than a decade of questions, answers bring hope and justice. Coming up, the key pieces leading to an admission. The 10 year anniversary of Caitlin's disappearance came and went. After a decade of false hope, many doubted there would ever be justice until a wintry evening in February 2023. Breaking now here at 6 o'clock, an arrest made in one of our area's most famous cold cases, the death of a 21-year-old Caitlin Markham. It's been a long time, but this is, uh, this is good news. A man by the name of Jonathan Palmerton was indicted for perjury. John Palmerton? Yeah. Arrested at his job. He's in custody. Prosecutors said he lied to investigators about the Markham investigation while under oath the previous year. I still try not to get myself too excited and, and, and wound up because I've had too many roller coasters, uh, things that didn't pan out. But yeah, I believe, I believe this is going to go somewhere. So who is Jonathan Palmerton? WLWT circled back to the private investigator. He was right there in their in their inner circle he was a close friend so any bonfires any parties anything like that uh john palmerton was involved in because he was one of john the john carter's best friends green previously interviewed palmerton for a podcast titled gone at 21. john palmerton was actually one of the first to arrive at caitlin's house after john carter discovered she was missing Here's what Palmerton said in the podcast about that day. Talked to Johnny, said he'd look through, didn't see anything that looked too out of sorts. Um, and kind of like try to you know, keep him calm. He was doing the pacing around. After Palmerton's arrest, Butler County prosecutors confirmed more details. A search warrant was executed at John Carter's mother's house, where he lived at the time of Caitlin's disappearance. Carter told me over the phone, this is a shock to me, and I don't know what to think at all. If John Carter was taken aback by his friend's arrest, one may wonder, how was he feeling a month later? They're coming out the front. He's in custody. When investigators showed up at his job. You guys copy. He's in custody. Put him in my car in the front. And charged him with two counts of murder. This has been a long time coming. Long time. In his heart, Dave always believed John was involved in some way. This is a this is a little bit more reassuring that um, my suspicions, you know, weren't totally off base. State of Ohio versus John Allen Carter. Carter escorted into a courtroom. And enter a plea not guilty this time. Butler County Prosecutor Mike Moser shared never before seen evidence, poems, his investigators found in a drawer inside Carter's mother's home. Carter's name handwritten on top. One reads in part, deep down I love her. You want to kill her, but I love her. She must die. I can't kill her. Yes, you can. Another, oh no, what have I done? What do I do? I know I'll bury the body in the backyard. No, I'll bury it under the trailer and wait until the grass grows over it and leave before anyone reports it missing. Yes, yeah, that's a great idea. Prosecutors say they also found this written in caps on top of a closet. I slit your wrist with a key to your heart. 
displays of a sinister side that Detective Nerlinger and Sergeant Whitlock say they saw years prior. I've interviewed from homicides to rapes down to trespasses a thousand people and I've never interviewed a psychopath and that's what I said when he left. I said that's the first psychopath I've ever interviewed. John Carter was released from the county jail after posting a $1 million bond. The perjury charge dismissed against his childhood friend, Jonathan Palmerton. The only explanation for Moser, Palmerton was going to be a witness in Carter's murder trial, and that would cause a conflict. Meanwhile, court filings gave us insight to the prosecutor's theory. Three to six months before Caitlin's disappearance, Caitlin confided in friends, saying she felt trapped in the relationship and was unhappy with Carter's lifestyles, including his heavy use of drugs and pornography. Another friend told police on the Friday before Caitlin was last seen alive, the mood between Caitlin and Carter was as if they were breaking up. Carter's cell phone activity was also of interest to prosecutors. Records show his phone became inactive just after midnight on August 14th and stayed that way for the next 15 hours. Caitlin's phone went dark two minutes after Carter's went inactive. I think something occurred in Fairfield in that apartment that night. Do I think that he may have had help dismembering her and getting her out to where she was dumped in Indiana? I, in my opinion, yes. A 13-year-old homicide case now wrapped in circumstantial evidence. With John Carter's trial date approaching, a surprise admission in court. What is your plea to count one involuntary manslaughter, a felony of the third degree? Guilty. After more than a decade of denying he had anything to do with Caitlin's death, Carter admitted his guilt. Dave got a front row seat, Nerlinger and Whitlock nearby. Just the relief. This was tough. Although an involuntary manslaughter conviction carries much less of a penalty than murder. He sat in front of Mr. Markham and told him, I killed your daughter. But how? Lawrence, will you say how Caitlin was killed? We, we can't make any comment right now. Okay. John, sure. can you say how? I can't. We may never know that answer. The only detail revealed in court, Caitlin died during a commission of a misdemeanor assault. The following day. No, you're all angry. Loved ones gathered to process how the maximum sentence Carter could receive is three years. When you think about 36 months, that sounds like nothing, nothing for her life. And that's true. There are not enough circles in hell for John Carter to visit. I understand. Through angry voices, there were also quiet words of comfort with a butterfly tree that had been planted in Caitlin's memory nearby. Dave was once again reminded he's not in this alone. Caitlin's spirit lives on. There's been days that I've had bad days in the early on times and the butterfly would come and fly around me. And I'm like, oh, hi, baby. And Dave knows he'll be surrounded by support tomorrow when Carter is sentenced. WLWT will have it covered. Have a good night.